degree and the PhD degree from electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley, 1998 and 19, or 2004. Yeah, as a matter of fact, first time I met him was back in 1996. I was, uh, I was his TA. <laughs> yeah, for the, for the equivalent course to the EECS 344 here, the case. Yeah, so, long time. Yeah? Yeah. So right after uh, Sunil finished his PhD, he joined the Cornell University as assistant professor. So his research interests focus on resonators for radio, microwave, photonic finance, micro-mechanical computing, x and the gyroscopes, mechanically locked the loops, and the hybrid NAMS and the CMOS technology. And the Professor Bahavi received the National Science Foundation Early Career Award, Cornell IEEE Chapter Professor of the Year Award in 2007, and the DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2008. All right, so with that, uh, and thanks, Mary. you from here up. Uh, am, I, am I okay? All right. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today, thanks for coming. Today I'll be talking about uh, some of the MEMS uh, resonator work that I've done uh, over the past few years, both at Berkeley and at Cornell. And uh, I want this to be very interactive, so feel free to raise your hands, ask questions. I might actually ask you guys questions, and so uh, I hope I get a response back, but otherwise it's not that, that fun. So uh, let's begin. Now where do RF MEMS resonators uh, have an insertion opportunity? Well, the key insertion opportunity is to actually just replace some of the components in a traditional heterogeneous uh, front end. That's not working. There you go. So you have a front end filter, you have a mixer, you have an IF filter, you have a crystal oscillator, and all these components can be are typically made out of SAW devices or you know f uh, film, acu film bulk acoustic resonators or quartz crystal resonators, and we want to fabricate all of these or the equivalent silicon devices all on the same substrate to try to make a single chip radio. And why did I get interested in this field was mainly because I saw this product right here. That's a Dick Tracy watch, and who doesn't want a Dick Tracy watch, right? Uh, however, this came out in 1999, believe it or not, and I actually tried it out. It's rather heavy, because all they did was they took your cell phone and just stuck it on your hand. And that's not exactly technology advancement. That's just better packing density of your PC board. So a sort of, you need sort of MEMS technology to try to actually make this heavy wristwatch into something that is actually a wristwatch that can be worn and can be utilized. Of course, the government is interested in this MEMS technology for trying to make some kind of a BlackBerry for the soldier, if say you will. You know, your BlackBerry maybe works uh, over two or three or four bands, maybe have a couple of data bands, do Wi-Fi. Well, the soldier's BlackBerry or the GTRS radio system needs to be able to work from, say, 20 megahertz to six gigahertz. They should be able to dial into FM or talk to a satellite. They should be able to receive video or upload video at really fast data rates. At the same time, they should be able to communicate without worrying about jamming. So they need to have all these kind of protocols. And so the serious size requirements uh, sort of enable MEMS to be sort of put into this uh, soldier's Blackberry, if you will. Also, another application is uh, smart dust kind of sensors. You have very small modes. You want really small radios that take very low energy, low power consumption. So these are some applications uh, where performance matters. So you can reduce your size, your weight, your power, but performance matters. If you don't meet the performance, you're not going to enter these markets. And so where the MEMS traditionally comes in in these particular places is you always start at the low end. You start with IF. Prove to the world that you can do IF very well using MEMS technology. And if you can do that, then you sort of move up the cost chain, if so you will, or move towards the antenna. So that's, I think MEMS right now is here, here, sort of getting into the front end there. Where MEMS can also make an impact is where you're willing to give up on a little bit of performance, but you really, really need your size, weight, and power to be extremely low. For example, in the case of nano air vehicles, so there are, these are a couple of air vehicles made at Caltech or at Berkeley. And you know, at Cornell, we also have the insect uh, cyborg program, which is also a kind of nano air vehicle. And you know, what do you need? Well, you need some kind of a communication system to talk to this particular vehicle. But more importantly, what you need is, where did it go? <laughs> right? 
So if you start making uh, flying vehicles, you want to sort of know where they are and then maybe use them for navigation using MEMSREF inertial sensors and so on and so forth. So here I'm willing to give up on performance, but I need the extreme size, weight, and power advantages that my MEMS resonators can give me. So these are probably two of the biggest motivating factors of the research going on in my group. So before we start, maybe I'll ask a few questions. Is why MEMS, right? Why mechanical structures? Why acoustic resonators? So let's just look at some of the resonators out there. There's an air cavity, right? A resonator air cavity is basically a standing wave, a sound wave that forms in your air cavity. So if I want to scale this device, which is at audible frequencies, up to a gigahertz, what kind of dimensions am I looking at for that cavity? So to do that, you sort of do a simple calculation. You can maybe say, well, what's the speed of sound? You're off. All right, something like 300 meters per second, right? And I want to get one gigahertz out of it. So what's my wavelength? So how would I calculate wavelength? Well, I basically have about uh, 300 meters per second times or divided by one gigahertz, right? Something like that. And that turns out to be around, if you really calculate it, around 300 nanometers. So a cavity, which will be about half the wavelength, will be around 170 nanometers. So I could make an acoustic cavity that will be around 170 nanometers. Not easy to fabricate. We'll have serious perfection issues, so you'll probably have low Q. Right? The other cavity that people in electrical engineering are really comfortable with is electromagnetic cavities. And what's the speed of light? This time, 3 times 10 to the 8. So instead of 300 meters per second, I sort of plug in 3 times 10 to the 8. Well, what happens here? Well, if I want to design an electromagnetic cavity at a gigahertz, my dimensions are order of centimeters. There's a reason why the cell phone is not shrinking in length. It's shrinking in width, it's shrinking in thickness, it's not shrinking in length. This is quarter wavelength. At, right? You can make it, you flip it, you actually get half wavelength, you get better reception. Right? So problem is not easy to fabricate 15 centimeter devices on, on a silicon wafer. Now, what really makes silicon resonators, or in general, acoustic resonators, perfect for this technology is that what's the speed of sound in silicon? Don't know. It's around 9,000 meters per second. Okay. So at a gigahertz, a half wavelength will come around 3 to 4 microns. That's something you can easily fabricate many, many times using any traditional lithography process in the, even in an educational clean room. So these are the dimensions that we can work with. And we have been working, and this is why we started doing RF MEMS mechanical resonators. Right? That's a big motivation. But of course, we want to start pushing to higher and higher frequencies. At 60 gigahertz, sound probably out of question. Let's not even worry about this. This starts looking interesting, and there's a lot of work in cavity, evanescent and cavity filters and resonators, because these are dimensions that can be machined. You can see a lot of work going on there. Problem is, uh, they're still pretty large at gigahertz. And it takes a lot of money to make these things at 60 gigahertz. You can scale the acoustic resonators to millimeter wave domains, but now you're reaching dimensions that are, which I just said here, are not fabricatable. But remember, this is single crystal silicon. It's a solid silicon. What device do you know of that has these dimensions? It's typically your transistors. All of you guys are working at the 130 nanometer node. Those are poly gates that are 130 nanometers wide. So it's not entirely out of question that you can sort of use modern lithography techniques to try to scale the silicon devices to even higher frequencies while maintaining the cues that we get with our devices. So that's the real academic reason why RF MEMS started looking at MEMS resonators to be put into cell phones or radios. What has been, what's out there? Well, this is an Agilent F-bar. This is basically two metal plates sandwiching an aluminum nitride piezoelectric 
uh, material. And when you hit it with the right frequency, the piezoelectric material vibrates. And you get a vertical thickness more resonance out of it. And it's already a product. Quite frankly, if you are using any CDMA phone right now, there is an Azulent F-bar duplexer in every cell phone that Samsung sells. Right. Problem with this particular design is that the resonant frequency depends only on the thickness of the device. So you can only make one resonant frequency in one deposition process. If you want multiple frequency, you do multiple depositions, multiple etches, which is not exactly cost effective. So Gianluca Piazza, Amy Duell, Roy Olson, Farouk Ayazi, a lot of these folks in the MEMS world have said, OK, instead of exciting in the vertical mode, we'll take the same aluminum nitride sandwiches, but we'll excite them in plane. And you can excite them in plane, and you can make filters with different resonant frequencies on the same die in the same lithography step. A typical trade-off, what do you think is the biggest trade-off between, say, the vertical mode and the lateral modes? Do they have the same efficiency? In one case, you're just squeezing vertically. You're applying an electric field in the vertical direction. You're squeezing in the vertical direction. In the other case, you're applying an electric field in the vertical direction. You're squeezing out in the lateral direction. So you have a Poisson head. Or you can say in the piezoelectric world, you're using the D31 coefficients instead of the D33 coefficients. And the D31 coefficients are smaller. So the maximum bandwidth of 40 megahertz that you can achieve in the F-bar, well, these are much narrower bandwidth filters. So that's the trade-off between the things. But both technologies are very mature. And so let's look at some of the pros and cons of this technology. First of all, they have excellent coefficient coupling. So you can really, what do you mean by coupling coefficient? It's the efficiency with which a transducer can convert electrical energy into a mechanical force. Right? And even for both directions, aluminum nitride does an excellent job. And you can make aluminum nitride resonators with cues up to 1,000 or up to 3,000 in air. So you don't even need any special packaging with devices. You can also boost the cue by sort of hooking up a high quality factor carrier material, like putting aluminum nitride on silicon or sapphire. So the acoustic energy is stored in that high quality factor material rather than the poor Q transducer material. So you can get a boost in your Q by doing that. Well, look at some of the cons. Well, first of all, the cues, even with that boosting, are still lower than published known electrostatic resonator cues. Electrostatic resonators easily get cues about 10,000. Secondly, there is no DC voltage control. I cannot turn on and off. I, once it's fabricated, that's it. So I cannot turn it on and off. I cannot tune it. I cannot get it back into a center frequency where I want. So I don't have any dynamic tuning ability with these filters. So when I reached Cornell, you sort of look at these two, and you say, well, if I were to approach the RFMEMS problem that the industry has not solved, I need to target these particular things. I need to make resonators, filters that solve these problems, because the, these are already in the product. So you start naively with capacitive transducers. In this case, this is a silicon germanium a comb drive resonator fabricated by Andrea Franke on top of four micron CMOS process, a baseline process in Berkeley's fab. And we graduated from there slowly to try to make silicon carbide differential filters. Uh, this particular filter, which we published at MEMS05, worked at around 173 megahertz. It had a bandwidth around half a megahertz, a very narrow bandwidth, high quality factor filter. The biggest problem with this filter was this insertion loss. It had an insertion loss of about 60 dB. So in band, if I put in a watt of power into this device, I basically get out a microwatt. Out of band, I get out a nanowatt. So it had a great chip factor, but it was the world's best filter attenuator that I ever made. <laughs> and the problem was, you go tell this to a cell phone manufacturer, they will say, oh, pretty SEM. That's it. <laughs> there is no electrical engineering use of this. And so the biggest problem we try to solve is how do I get the impedance lower? How do I make this air gap transducer with lower and lower impedance? And so one approach was to say, well, the impedance only depends on the area of the transducer. So I can just increase the area. I can keep making a very, very large resonator. Here's an outrageous resonator. This is a ring. 
Look at the scale, it's 200 microns. This ring is about four millimeters in diameter. So the way this ring vibrates is that the outer edge of the ring expands outwards and the inner edge expands inwards. The whole ring sort of dilates in a second harmonic mode. And we made this large enough that it will have 50 ohm impedance. But what are some of the problems with this kind of structure? Somebody said something. Money. money. Actually, money is not the problem. <laughs> You're in university. Why do you care about money? <laughs> Biggest challenge is manufacturing, right? If you're going to make a 50 nanometer air gap around a you know, 24 millimeter circumference of this thing, this is non-trivial. So our yield was like one, like one device, not 1%. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Secondly, when you have a ring this big, it's not only going to have the mode of vibration that you want, but it's going to have all kinds of rubber band modes, string modes. So it'll have lots of parasitic modes of vibration that you don't exactly desire. So making a structure necessarily bigger is not the solution to the problem. What you really want to see is, can I improve the efficiency of that air gap transducer that I'm using, which is fundamentally flawed in that it's very poor efficiency. So by the time you enter the fifth year of grad school and you're glaring at this equation for five years, you say, well, OK, I played with the A. I tried to make the gap as small as possible. I try to increase the voltage to a value beyond which it just explodes our arcs. And then I look at it. Well, that's one thing is epsilon. That's epsilon naught. That's air or vacuum. That's epsilon is one. I wish air had a higher epsilon, <laughs> right? Because it's epsilon square. And you say, well, you start looking at literature, and then you find that your fellow grad students who are working in their device group have been working with high K devices and materials for a very long time. In fact, hafnium dioxide was around that time being introduced as a high-k gate dielectric, and it had an epsilon of 30. 30 squared, that's a 1,000 x improvement in performance, just like that. Very tempting. But then you say, wait a minute, how is the structure going to move if I fill up the gap with a solid dielectric? So maybe you need to figure out a way to position the dielectric in the right location. So this we you need to re-optimize re it. Maybe the dielectric's acoustic velocity should be as close to the resonator material so that homogeneously it looks like one acoustic material. So there are certain caveats to this. But nonetheless, the opportunity is there. You can do epsilon squared kind of performance with it. I thought I'd stumble upon something that nobody had invented. I mean, so I was like, wow, I filed a disclosure, everything. Uh, problem was, then you start looking at literature, you find this guy Fisher. He's so, a German scientist, pre-World War II, so you can imagine where his biases lie. Um, he wrote a book called Fundamentals of Electroacoustics in 1942, where he actually did a very beautiful derivation of just what I told you. And the Navy got hold of these books in 1950s, and they translated it into English, and you know, now you can look it up. He actually did a very nice job of analytically calculating the efficiency of all six different ways of transducing stuff transducing membranes, resonators, so on and so forth, both electrostatically and electromagnetically. And so one of the things he had proposed was, hmm, wonder if instead of air we use dielectric. <laughs> this is the efficiency to this beautiful equation. And at the end of the chapter ends, I don't know what this is useful for, maybe microphones. Now, that's not, that's really true, you know? You have, everybody knows about electric microphones. Electric microphones have charges in their nitride membranes. So yes, he was on the right track. Say, so, well, what about the MEMS world? It turns out Sebe Bostra in 89, while he was uh, just finishing his PhD, was trying to make uh, sort of, this is a silicon, you can see the KOH cut, just make a silicon cantilever beam. He put a very thin layer of silicon nitride on top and applied a voltage across that dielectric. And he was able to vibrate the cantilever beam and then detect the motion due to the change in capacitance, due to the strain in the nitride. Now, he did this to try to compete, look at the date, 1989, with people like Bill Tang, who were making comb drives around the same time. Right? And his advisor said, this is really useless. This thing moves maybe a sub-micron. Bill Tang's comb drive moves 10 microns. We are in the business of making large displacement MEMS actuators back in those days. And so they abandoned this project. So when he saw our work in Transducers 05, he was like, wait a minute, I could have just taken my device 
applied 500 megahertz, and the device would have actually vibrated, becoming the first RF MEMS device. <laughs> so thank God he didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, other people have done this before, and it's just we happen to stumble upon it at the right time. That sort of works out favorably for us. So in my final year, we quickly built, we took an SOI wafer, we patterned uh, using DRIE, put a very thin layer of silicon nitride, and then did poly electrodes on top. It's a very simple process. There's nothing, it's something you can run in one week in the clean room, right? And once you do that, uh, how does it work? It's very simple. You basically apply sort of a DC plus AC, a typical electrostatic actuating force across the dielectric. When there is that kind of force across the dielectric, the dielectric is going to squeeze. As the dielectric squeezes, it gets pushed out. Right? As it gets pushed out, if it is adhering well to the silicon block underneath, it will take the silicon block along for the ride. So there's a trade-off there, depending on the thickness of the silicon block and all. But for now, let's just go with that. So that's how you would vibrate this device. Once you set it in vibration, how do you measure it? Well, as it starts straining, the nitride is going to expand and contract. It's going to get stressed and strained. And that's going to give me a current, a DC DT, some current that is proportional to the change in capacitance of the nitride. So very simple process. Some of the devices we looked at, the moment we reached Cornell, John Vig had visited Cornell, and he was like, I wonder why nobody makes shear resonators in silicon. Quartz resonators are shear mode resonators that have Qs of millions. Why don't you try to make a shear resonator? So I said, okay, well, maybe I can take this device, and instead of the bar moving entirely, I make the silicon thick enough that only the top surface moves, and the bottom surface is lethargic or inertia, let's say. And then I will have a gradient in the force along the thickness, and maybe I can excite a shear mode of vibration in silicon. So using the nitride, we were for the first time able to actually generate tangential electrostatic forces. Now remember, air gap electrostatic forces are only normal. We're able to generate tangential electrostatic forces on structures. And so we were able to generate shear mode vibrations in a silicon bar. You get Qs of around 7,000 at room temperature and pressure, and insertion loss on the order of 4 or 5 dB. So we, we reduced the impedance. We still retain the high Q of silicon. And we are doing with a very nominal DC bias. So we reduced all the challenges in some sense in terms of these devices. Well, how about tuning? It turns out if you really look, pay close attention, this is not pure shear. Pure shear is anti-symmetric. It goes in one direction or the other. When you squeeze something down, it's going to shear in both directions. So it's a symmetric shear mode. So you can see the symmetry of it. And because of that, at the edges, where there is no boundary condition, it's open free boundary condition, it's going to bend. It'll tip over a little bit. Well, bending is a soft mode. And if it's soft, I can use an air gap closing actuator to bend it even more. And if I bend it even more, I can change that component of the overall resonant frequency and tune the resonant frequency of my resonator over about 10 megahertz at 800 megahertz. And nobody had done that above 100 megahertz with more than a one ppm before. And we are showing around 1% with this technology while retaining the Q, even as we were tuning it. So once you have a tunable resonator, the next thing you do is try to build a parametric filter out of it. So you can have a ladder configuration. You have all these control voltages patterned from the backside, or just backside edges of your silicon substrate. And you can either change the resonant frequency or change the bandwidth of your filter, so on and so forth. So now we have a perfectly frequency agile filter that we can plug and play maybe into the IF or the high RF bands of our radios. For the delta F tuning, how, how large is the tuning voltage? Oh, that depended on the gap. In this particular case, I believe it's about 16 volts. Yes. That was just the clearance that we had. Of course, you can get wider tuning range, but you pull in and crash. So that's the limitation there. Nonetheless, uh, the fundamental problem with shear modes, just like the F-bar, is that it's dependent on the thickness of the bar. So I'm getting tuning, but I'm not getting it for multiple frequencies, which is what I really want. So in-plane motion, for in-plane modes of vibration, 
Can we do shear? The answer was yes, but it was not very obvious to me and my student how you would do it. So we decided to take a different approach. We'll say, well, let's try to use electrostatics. Let's try to use what we are good at. For example, if I take a four-pole filter, that is, I have four resonators coupled by very soft coupling springs. They're not necessarily discs. They can be any other shape, just symbolically calling a disc here. So you have four resonators that are contour modes, or basically in-plane resonators, that are coupled by soft coupling springs. Forget the DC biases on the middle two. If I just drive the first and measure the motion from the last, I would get a four-pole response. I have four degenerate modes of vibration out of this. Right. Now what if I selectively then turn on and apply the input signal to not just the first one, but to the first two, and collect the motion current from not just the last one, but from the last two? So even though they're mechanically softly coupled, I'm electrically forcing them to behave together. So in this sense, I actually end up be getting sort of a two-pole system, a two lumps of resonator groups. Right? Depending on the DC bias, then I can excite either the first two modes and select the left subband of this bandpass filter or select the right subband by just changing the polarization voltages on my filter. So now how you can imagine this can be scaled to say a 10 by 10 array, and I can have a block bandwidth, and I can select any subband of any resolution in that wide bandwidth filter. This is not something you can do with LOM nitride. Right? This is due to the fact that I have electrostatic voltage control of this particular structure. So we fabricated, in this case, a four-pole filter. And you can see, you can see the four bands. And you can see that you can either select the left subband or the higher subband depending on the DC bias voltages. Now, if you pay close attention, here I showed a perfect two-pole response. Right? In the data, actually, I can see all four of them. Right? I can see the two peaks. I can see the two attenuated peaks. Why is that? Well, you can electrostatically always drive them together. So the drive forces can be together. But the sense doesn't need to be together. You're not forcing anything on the sense side. So in reality, it's not a two-pole system, but it's actually a three-pole system. These two are not dependent on each other. They're independent. And so you will see attenuation poles, right? You'll see atten but the peaks are attenuated due to common mode cancellation of the motional current, depending on how you sum or subtract the two currents. So this is another way to make a programmable filter. And uh, we showed this first, and then recently at MEMS09, we were able to take our devices and package them using EPI encapsulation processing technology at Elder Stanford. So we now have a vacuum package resonator system on a way for, for further processing of CMOS if you want. All right, so let's go back to the dielectric case. We looked at air. Air is bad. Then we started looking further. You say, OK, nitride is good. Hafnia is even better. Right? But oh, man. Look at BST. That's something, 300. So naively, I was like, oh, this is it. You just want to do BST. Well, of course, then you look at the material scientists and say, well, what is this BST thing? Because I just Googled it and I found it. And they say, oh, BST is this amazing material. It's actually electrostrict tube material. And what that means, it, uh, well, simply from an electrical engineering standpoint, it means that I can tune it with a voltage, just like electrostatics. But at the same time, it has a very high coupling coefficient. In fact, it's much higher than even nitride. Right? And so it's sort of like piezoelectric, but it is voltage tunable. So I sort of get the good of both sides. What's the catch? Well, first of all, it is very low Q. They're tertiary materials. The reason why they're tunable is because they have a lot of air pockets in them. Right? And they may be leaky. <laughs> So they make conduct current, and so they're not exactly uh, easy to control fabrication or manufacturing of. So there are some other trade-offs associated with this. The biggest trade-off from the MEM standpoint, though, is that material scientists have figured out ways to deposit BST, deposit PZD, deposit all kinds of these tertiary electrostrictive materials. Nobody knows how to etch them. And so you have to go back to old school and start doing iron milling of this materials, and you need a very, very dedicated graduate student or a collaboration partner who is willing to sit next to the iron mill and turn it on and off 
as the wafer heats up due to the ion milling. So it's a very careful process. But if you can do this, you can make some really, really beautiful devices. This is our resonator in this case. You can see the two resonators coupled with a coupling spring here. I look at some of the interesting things. Uh, the first thing is you can see that I have this sort of uh, wire bond, if say you will, that goes from this pad here onto the bond pad. It shows up clearly here. This is the landing pad, and it goes to a giant bond pad off. Why is that? Well, if the bond pad is sitting on a material that has an epsilon of 300 or 800, then you basically have a shunt capacitance to ground at RF frequency. So all your signal will just go to ground through the bond pad. Nothing will actually go into the device. So people use air bridge technology to try to isolate the bond pad away from the actual device. So there's a maximum power transfer from the RF landing probes into your mechanical resonator. And this process was perfected by Army Research Labs. So it, we transferred our ideas, they took it, they added their own ideas, and they made this process happen. They added their own RF MEM switches. So you see an RF MEM switch here, and a close up here. And now we had two filters, you had two switches, you had one RF input, you can route it in either direction, left or right. So you can either get no pass, band pass one or band pass two. And the switch we showed was very little loss, it's about one dB loss right now. And then you can turn it on and off. At the same time, we still have a DC bias control that allows us to change the bandwidth of our filter. So we still have a parametric filter, we also have a switchable bank of it. So you're now trying to really make a parametric filter array to try to put into those frequency agile radios that we talked about. Is dielectric transduction limited to solid dielectrics? No. Any dielectric will work. One of the best dielectrics is very high dielectric constant is water. What's the permittivity of water? 80? Yeah. So I have a force that's about 6,000 times larger. If I just take my resonator, and instead of doing the CPD and all this stuff, I actually just leave it in there. <laughs> it will work better. Counterintuitive. Uh, but so initially, we just took our old resonator, put a drop of water on it, said, let's measure. Nothing happened. So like, oh, it must be mass loading. That's the biggest problem with putting water on top of your resonator. So try to do it a little bit more smartly. We took our resonator, coated it with a SAM coating, a hydrophobic coating, and then put a droplet of water somewhere far away from the device. And then we sort of tipped the chip back and forth. And the droplet of water sort of rolled over the resonator and then rolled over the other side slowly wicking the gap. We only want water here because we want the force. We don't want the damping due to the mass loading, but we do want the force. So you can do that. You can see that your insertion loss will improve in air around 70 dB to dipped in water of around minus 30 dB. In addition, the water gives you about 80 times larger force. So you can do electrostatic spring tuning even at hundreds of megahertz. So you're getting spring tuning of like 3% in liquid. And water, you will argue, will at some point have electrolysis issues or will have other, it is a bipolar molecule. But there are some other dielectrics that we are looking into, like glycerin, which is around epsilon of 50, I think. So there are other things that you could use that are nonpolar, and that this will sort of work out for that. So we proceeded from uh, putting dielectrics on top taking the Poisson head, because I squeezed it, I pushed it out. In this case, I don't have a Poisson head. The transducer is in line, in the direction of the mechanical motion. And so what we would like to do is actually just do that, right? And so this is what we proposed at Hilton Head, just before I left for Cornell, is basically take our resonator, just fill it up with the dielectric material. Our Clark Nguyen students uh, then showed that they took their old air gap resonator masks, and instead of doing an oxide spacer release, they filled it up with nitride. So these are resonators that were fabricated to be optimally transduced in air, and they filled it up with a dielectric instead of air. The problem is maybe the dielectric is at the wrong place, at an inefficient location for this particular transduction. Because in this case, this wants to expand, but the dielectric is actually obstructing the motion. So they got signal, they got improvement, but they didn't get that much improvement in the behavior. 
So you want to be careful about where you position the dielectric in that solid resonator. And so you take a theoretical look at it, you say, okay, this is my resonator, I position a dielectric at some location from the center, and I have electrodes on either side. And I want to optimize this location, this D, and the, how much dielectric do I need. So these are my two optimization parameters for different modes of vibration of this bar. So you solve that, and you get the familiar Rx expression. If you ignore these two terms, this is exactly the Rx expression that you get for air gap transducer. But now you have these extra terms. There's a cosine squared term and a sine squared term. The cosine squared term, if you write it out, it basically is telling you that a dielectric needs to be placed at the maximum strain location, not at a maximum displacement location. In fact, a maximum displacement location has zero strain. It's a free boundary condition. You want it to be at a position where it can be completely squeezed. Right? So it's no longer an air gap, which is a maximum displacement, but it's a maximum strain. Secondly, you want this sine squared term to be one, or as close to one as possible. And what that says is, well, to do that, the dielectric, in fact, should be about half the wavelength that you're designing a resonator to be. So, well, that sort of leads to some interesting plots. But you can see, for this sine term to be one, I need it to be half the dimension of the bar, or you know, corresponding in that order. But on the other hand, I have gap to the fourth kind of dependence in the numerator. So I cannot really make it very large because my impedance will go up. So you plot it out, you find that, uh, in fact, as the resonant frequency goes up, that is when the gap becomes closer and closer to that wavelength, my transducer actually improves in efficiency. My impedance drops. So I have a, I have a transducer that not just constant in performance, actually improves at smaller and smaller dimensions. Now some would argue that, uh, well, Q doesn't remain constant, so the solid line is sort of cheating. F times Q is, remains constant. But even then, you will find that it'll improve over frequency. This is more clear in taking the same resonator, but exciting it at different harmonics. For example, if I excite it right here at this particular point, we'll actually find that both the third harmonic and the ninth harmonic will be excited when I place the dielectric about two thirds of the way from the center. But the ninth harmonic actually has lower impedance than the third harmonic. Why? Because the wavelength is closer to the dimension of the gap. Now I can selectively place the dielectric. For example, I could place the dielectric somewhere here. You know. In that case, I would excite the third harmonic, but not excite the ninth harmonic, or in the other way. I could excite the ninth harmonic, but not excite the third harmonic. So by selectively positioning the dielectric, I can selectively excite a particular mode of vibration while attenuating the rest of the modes of vibration in the same device. So I can scale up to higher frequencies while keeping micron scale dimensions without worrying about parasitic lower frequency modes of vibration because I selectively attenuate them. So we made this device. Here the device is about eight microns wide it's about uh, 30 microns long. You can see the two electrodes, and there's a very thin layer of nitride. We etched away the nitride. So it's about over 20 nanometers thick nitride film in there. And we measured the response of this device at both the third harmonic and the ninth harmonic. We found that the third harmonic is about, you know, has a higher impedance than the ninth harmonic. Now, the Q discre uh, discrepancy here is 10,000, it's about 1,700. That was not part of the derivation. The impedance is assuming a constant Q. So we are getting a Q boost, which just is the artifact of this particular device. So even if you normalize out the Q, you'll find that the absolute transducer strength improved by about 3x, which is about predicted was about 4.5x. We got about 3x improvement, even after normalizing for the quality factor enhancement. But this is ex really exciting, because you're getting an FQ product that is already past quartz, approaching sapphire kind of FQ dimensions. So where are we and how, where can we go? If you plot out the different energy loss mechanisms in silicon resonators, you'll find that you have a couple of them. You have anchor losses, 
you have phonon, local phonon effects, thermoelastic dissipation, so on and so forth. That sort of forms the FQ boundary, this black line. So as you go higher in frequency, the Q drops. And we are somewhere here, and so we are trying to push maybe up here and maybe down there, right? We want to go to higher frequencies, and we want to go to higher Q, both. There are applications and opportunities in both directions. So how do we go to higher frequencies? Well, if you look at this particular device, just remember, there's a silicon bar. There are electrodes on both sides. This is a transistor that was made in Berkeley in 1999. It's a FinFET transistor. It basically, if you take a regular FinFET, where there's a gate and a channel underneath, and just rotate it by 90 degrees, then I have a transistor on the side of the fin rather than on top of the fin. And so this is a FinFET transistor. You have this gate that is sitting on top of the silicon fin, and the transistor action takes place on both sides. So if I can, this technology already exists. If I take a fin fed and release the fin fed, then depending on the dimension of the fin fed, I could get into millimeter wave frequencies. So our technology that is using the same materials that are used in modern transistors, there is no compatibility, oh, my material is compatible, this or that. It's in your fab. It's in there. It's happening it already exists. You're making transistors, so just make my resonator next to it. It's in the exact same technology. Now, what would be more interesting is if you don't have to release it. If you can make a transistor that does not need to be released, well, now the boundary line in the definition of a resonator and what is a resonator, what is a transistor, is going to blur. So maybe if you wanted to make an oscillator, you had a resonator and some sort of a gain stage to put in a loop. I can actually make the transistor vibrate. So one of the projects that we have currently going on, and I'm recruiting graduate students if they're undergrads here, is to try to make a vibrating transistor. And we call it the resonant body transistor. Sort of the cool factor would be to try to make the world's sort of smallest electrostatically transduced device. It's a footprint of one FinFET. All right, so that's uh, what would you do with it? Well, you know, you can imagine that you have a stack of this. And you have your little transistors and your vibrating transistors all encapsulated. So this is sort of extreme MEMS CMOS integration, if say you will. MEMS industry has always been trying to find the corresponding CMOS partner to try to make their devices with. Right? But the only successful products out there are analog devices with their accelerometer line and TI with their DMD projectors. There's no other really integrated, well, MEMSIC has one, but that's really just post-processing CMOS. There's no real mechanical structure and CMOS next to each other. That's successful. So here I'm saying we'll bend over completely backwards. We'll say, we'll take your TSMC process. You wouldn't even know it, but we are doing some MEMS in it. We're actually vibrating some of the transistors that we just laid out in your process. Now, if the IC industry doesn't agree to that, then I don't know what they will agree with in terms of MEMS CMOS integration. So that's the final sort of proposal that I have, is to make an unreleased resonator transistor in the front end of your CMOS process. Some applications. One of the problems we ran into when we were talking to uh, some of our Intel uh, colleagues or ex-Cornell alums is, believe it or not, one of the biggest yield hits with the Core 2 Duo, for example, is a temperature sensor. These chips get really hot, so they have some very fancy architectures to do temperature monitoring of different hot spots on the chip. And the way to do that is, and we take analog circuits, how do you design a temperature sensor? PTAT, right? Some kind of temperature sensor, which is reference to a band gap. But that requires BJTs. Now if you're making FinFETs or any kind of high technology, high-end CMOS, to make BJTs become that much more difficult. And Intel rejects Pentiums because one of those parasitic BJTs fails. So that's a serious cost hit. It would be nice if you could make a temperature sensor in CMOS. So one of the proposals is if you could have two of these resonator transistor oscillators with te different temperature slopes, then you can do typical temperature compensation. You have a hash table with two different slopes. The difference in the frequency is proportional temperature. Right? So this is what we are proposing to uh, Intel, and they seem to have bought it so far, is to try to take one of their transistors or a couple of their transistors and just vibrate them, and then figure out what the temperature at a particular hot spot on the chip is. So this would be one of the applications. You can imagine one of the other applications could be uh, clock distribution 
for your microcontrollers or microprocessors, or just local clock generation. I mean, one of the fun projects I give in my digital circuits class is just how do you design the H3 network to distribute the clock to all the nodes on your chip? Well, here it'll be different. I have a democracy of clocks, each powering a particular subsystem on your microcontroller or your multiprocessor chip. The other project is to sort of look beyond. So, so far I talked about maybe pushing the boundaries. Still in silicon. I want to stay in silicon, but I then I'm sort of stuck at this boundary. You know, you want to go beyond. I want to go here. You know, that would be nice. Or more importantly, I want to go here because here it's low. This low, the Q is too low. I want to go here. I want to exceed this boundary, which is very low Q. And so you sort of, you know, you're at university, you look around what other people are doing. And uh, one of the projects that uh, you always notice, especially at this point in every university, is that there's a silicon photonics group, commonly on every, every university. And those silicon photonics guys, they sort of make these rings or disks and something, and they commonly code optical cues of a million. So it's like, man, this is too, <laughs> like, first year grad student comes in, you just do the little e-beam and get a cube of a million. Well, good for you. The poor MEMS guys are struggling for six years to get these kind of cues. So I would really like this cue at this frequency. So there should be a way to sort of get that optical cue, tap into that cue, but get it at the RF frequency that I really want. So one of the projects that we started was, well, what really gives the quality factor? Well, the quality factor is basically how much time does the energy stay in your delay element, in your storage element, in this case, an optical? So what we are proposing to do is to take your RF signal, modulate light with it. So you basically upconvert an RF signal to the optical domain. And you send that upconverted signal round and round and round one of these photonic rings. It stays there for minutes. It enhances its Q by millions. Finally comes out, I detected the photo detector. Well, what do I get? A detector is not fast enough. So the light intensity shows up as DC, RMS value. And then I get a sideband at the RF frequency. So I measure the sideband, boost it up a little bit, and put it back into a feedback loop. Now, this technique was first proposed by Lute Maleki at JPL uh, in about 1996. And he even started a company called OE Waves. They used a Mark Zender modulator a giant spool of fiber, about two kilometers long, and a very fancy indium something something detector. So it was almost like a tabletop system. Recently, the company has made a product about the size, about this big, about four inches by two inches. But what we are proposing is we'll make everything in silicon. And we will never enter the electrical domain. There is no Mark Zender modulator or pin diodes. This is a mechanical modulator. When the mechanical disk expands, the optical disk expands, it changes its wavelength. So I can AM modulate light mechanically, not optically, or not electrically. So it's almost like mechanical to optical, well, there's still an electrical part. Now, if you could figure out a way to go back from electrical to mechanical, without, or me optical to mechanical, without ever going to the electrical domain, that will be something. So sort of working on that as well. But the key observation is both our resonators, whether it's a mechanical resonator or the optical resonator, are built in a two-mask SOI process. And have been doing so for the last five years. Only recently, we started doing things together. So hopefully, we'll have results soon, or soon, very soon. So I'd like to summarize what I spoke about. We talked about first voltage tunable and voltage switchable filters and resonators, and then sort of going up to very high frequencies to characterize these things, as well as showing them at very high frequencies, and eventually into CMOS integration, and maybe talk a little bit about photonics, and maybe the last topic is of more interest to everybody. So uh, I'll stop here and take questions. too hungry. Um, for the uh, optical stuff, which is really cool, um, how's the power consumption on that if you guys use like a laser and all that? It's just a laser.
Uh, we, use a, we are just using a diode laser, a few milliwatts. Uh, definitely, there are two things. Yeah, it's a laser. And secondly, you can imagine the phase noise is actually the laser's phase noise. <laughs> if you design the system right, you'll be dominated by the laser phase noise. But that already is very good, so we should be OK. So any, any particular element? Any, any particular what? Uh, hope to not need it. Yeah. Right. But right now, we are just having a 10 dB gain. Yeah, that's enough. Any noise figure requirement? Uh, haven't done the analysis so far on that particular part. The uh, idea, then, you, you know, if you don't need the LNA, then people may wonder, why is Darren agreeing with me that uh, they, you don't need a gain element in an oscillating loop? And the answer is the current is coming to the DC bias. There's a DC bias on this, is where you're getting the gain. So it's not like it's no gain. There is, a, there is a, some gain coming out of the DC bias. Well, can you, can you come uh, just for the, you know, I guess the, for the student's benefit, uh, the, any potential disadvantage of you know, miniaturizing the size for these filters? Yes, the, the two, the two. Uh, one of them, I mean, actually there are one, but you can say it in two ways. One is maybe a common language, is to just say that the power handling. How much power can I put in the filter before it vaporizes? Right? And the smaller you make them, the smaller volume they have, the smaller amount of energy they can store, or smaller amount of energy they can handle. So if you saw, the radio that I proposed is not really a radio, it's a receiver chain of the radio, where power is in the milliwatt range. I didn't show you a transmit filter. I didn't show you a transmit path. Because you might be transmitting in watts, and we still have to figure out a way to make MEMS resonators very small that can handle high power. Now, the technical way to say it is that the IIP3 is very small. So about the, um, the temperature sensor, is that like it's over the industrial range, like the, the, the temperature range? Oh, uh, no. Uh, they. Um, Actually, the problem was getting, I, I cannot answer your question because they weren't, they were, this information was sort of leaked in some ways. It should, it's not really public. So, <laughs> so when I asked a group in Santa Clara who is maybe not as close to the Oregon fabs, they immediately told me this problem. And then I, in, you know, sort of, made, I wanted to make sure that it is indeed true. So I sort of called some people in Oregon, which is right there, the first, you know, that's their main foundry. And they just like, no comment or something. I got emails like that, so I knew it was true. So uh, then I asked some of the computer architects, at, uh, one, of, one of my friends at Berkeley, and I asked him how important is this temperature sensing. He said it's extremely important because it can really fry things up. And so there's a threshold beyond which that they don't want to reach. But, the, but they do want to come as close to the threshold as possible. So we are not talking about over a very large temperature range, but a threshold, but accurately positioning up to that threshold. Uh, the other thing with these temperature sensors is the overhead, right? Whenever you're designing a temperature system, then there's, it's not doing work for you in terms of computing. So you're wasting CMOS space, you're wasting CMOS power, and wasting die space that probably is worth millions of dollars. So making them as small as possible is actually important. So uh, we hope that these things, which are transistor size, will be useful in that respect. Yeah, just a question back here. Yes. My question all has to do with lifetimes and anything mechanical, something bends, it gets tired down the line. It's fatigue, that is, it's a proper word. Um, how long can we expect these things to last? I mean, if you take a typical microprocessor today, it may last five years, it may last 50 years. We don't always know. But if you put something mechanical in there, that says to me that that chip's lifetime is kind of like uh, that mechanical thing is going to. Well. But two, two answers. One is that we don't move as much. As we started going to gigahertz frequencies, the displacements that we're talking about are on the order of picometers. Nothing really moves. And if nothing really moves with respect to the, you know, sort of the fractional displacement beyond the limit, the maximum limit, we are like at PPM compared to the maximum strain limit of silicon at these frequencies. So we're nowhere close to sort of exerting them really hard to try to test that limit of our resonators. Uh, the only concern that I was asked is, you're now using a dielectric, it's not an air gap. And the dielectric might charge over time. And dielectric charging is definitely a problem with transistors or with memory chips and so on and so forth. So right now, my biggest concern in terms of reliability of these devices 
is the dielectric charging. And what can you do to prevent that charging? And the simple answer I have for you is I just read some IEDM papers. How do they solve it? And then make sure I follow the same procedure. So basically, it involves a annealing step with some forming gas or something like that. And typically, that takes care of dielectric charging so far. But we haven't done long-term studies on that. You know, one is when you talk about electrically switching the resonator, uh, the sensing elements, like right, between the different bands. Mm -hmm. Can you come around the the in band ripple? Yeah. So, so the, the in band ripple can be improved by having the proper termination. The trade off, of course, is that if you have higher and higher termination, your rejection, so your shape factor of the filter will inflate, and so you won't get as much of a shape factor. So. You will find a lot of the MEMS resonators, and you know I can see the circuits guy asking me this question. It's like, if you take a saw filter, you get very nice ripples. They're symmetric. MEMS always has some nastiness to it. And the main reason, if you really think about it, is due to the fact that we have a manufacturing variation between the different resonators. Right? That's the biggest problem. If you can overcome the manufacturing variations, if you make them precise, then you will be able to improve on the f ripple factor or the in-band uh, shape of that so particular the filter. Absolutely. So there, there's some work. I don't know if I have. Uh, let's see. Maybe uh, this is one thing we did to overcome that a little bit. And unfortunately, I don't seem to have the data slide. But but if you think of a filter, right? You basically have sort of an end pole filter and mass spring dampers are coupled with some springs. That really allows you for one path for the energy to go from the input to the output. And any manufacturing variation along that path is going to cause in-band ripple variations. Right? So one way to overcome that problem is to sort of make a 2D filter. So we made a 2D array with a little difference. The x-axis is a weakly coupled axis, which means that actually defines your filter. So in this case, it's a three-pole filter. Right? And the y-axis coupling springs, these ones, are actually extremely stiff springs. They're very strongly coupled. So what I'm doing here is I'm allowing the acoustic energy to enter at multiple input points, but to traverse nine different paths, for example, instead of just one. Right? That averages up the slope a little bit, and you get a very nice ripple response. Now you could say, why can't you do it electrically? Why not just sum it electrically? The answer is you'll get three, not nine. And so is this mechanical coupling really taking use advantage of MEMS two-dimensional fabrication ideology? And this, this was actually proposed by John Judge um, out of the NMAS project. And we sort of recently showed it at frequency control that we can actually make this thing work. And we showed that by doing a mechanical coupling, we improve the ripple while maintaining the shape factor. So the cost of what? And times the space. Exactly. Last question. You showed the key in the air, right? Mm -hmm. and you also mentioned the vacuum encapsulation. Is there any difference in the key of the vacuum package? Uh, maybe about 10% improvement. Oh, really? Yeah, not that much. Uh, the high frequency devices, uh, another question for you guys. What is the mean free path of air? <coughs> Nanometers, right? Few nanometers. 65 nanometers. Our devices move about picometers. Are we really hitting atoms? Not in the same way the comb drives hit atoms. So we don't really have air damping like, say, comb drives do air damping. So that's why the Q does not really change from vacuum to air that much. Most of the Q is actually dominated by the anchor losses or by the phonon losses in the structure. No, we just we just hermetic packaging enough. Yes, absolutely. Just to be elegant or fancy or. He's a mechanical guy. Electrical is too easy. It's like, <laughs> it's like cheating. It's like then you have to go talk to Darren. <laughs> The reality answer is, well, you will have some short noise from the transistors in there. 
So if you can reduce a noise source, obviously you reduce a noise source. You could be. That's that's. I don't. I, we don't have the analysis done yet. What you want to be dominated is by the laser. So because you know that's that's your input. So. Any questions? Any other questions? No. Let's take our speaker.